Okie dokie. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I am doing great. Um, other than being, you know, crazy and behind and all of that usual stuff. <laughs> I made a huge error in my life. Uh oh. I don't have enough coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that one. I left my water out on the front porch. Let oh man. That. Let me get the. Uh, yeah. Man. You know, the good thing with us is we, we take care of our dogs. We always forget our stuff. I have a rule for that. <laughs> Hi everyone, how are you doing? So I am on live. Yep. <laughs> the nice thing about having a, a second half is that they um they can help out sometimes. Exactly, exactly. So hi, this is Roman with Holistic Dog Training, and today we have our special guest again, Caitlin <laughs> Coverley with uh, 101dogspots.com. So where are you watching uh, this video from? Because we are in Oregon. Yay! Yeah, we're both but, in Oregon, which is exciting. <laughs> right? So interesting. And we support each other because we have a common interest. We want you and your dogs to be well-educated and be the smartest ones in your, in your area. So where are you guys from? So Cherry is from Texas. Hi there. And Bonnie, good morning. Good morning, Bonnie. Gulf Coast of Michigan. Uh, yeah, Michigan, right? Mississippi. 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 <laughs> <Duh>. <laughs> oh, man. Or Missouri. I, I'm, I'm oh, glad no. that. What? What is it? Missouri or Mississippi? I, I don't know my acronym. You know so. what? I have to pass the test to have a full citizenship. I would just fail right there. Bonnie, thank you. <laughs> So you you want to comment in your you want to comment in the text where you're from and um, tell me a bit about your story and what do you like here being on our show? We are every day, every Saturday here um, changing lives, but not one life at a time. We make as many lives as possible at a time. Yes. Caitlin actually goes beyond that and says, you know what? I'm not dealing with one person at a time. I'm going to deal with multiple trainers at the same time. So we spread the word better, the same thing I do. Plus we do these live sessions for you guys to kind of go a little bit further. So we have a clarification here. It is Mississippi. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for the geographical in, uh, education here. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about error free living with your dog part two. For you guys who missed part one, I'm going to add the link in the comments so you guys don't miss the part one. Because the problem is if you miss people, those pieces, then you don't have a clear picture. So before we talked about what exactly in part one. Uh, sorry, you're asking me to kind of recap part yes. one. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, and, and I've been thinking about this a little bit it, it, in trying to make things clear, but the, mm -hmm. I, I think part one was kind of a gestalt of what it is. And gestalt is, you know, that kind of broad brush painting, you know, what Okay, we... gestalt is German, I'm Austrian. Let me explain, gestalt is a form, a well-formed form. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's nice to have the, the guy online who actually knows, like, I don't speak German. So, yeah. so, 
so we we had a nice good ramble through error free living um, on the last time, and I, and I think it's a great place to start. Is kind of what do I mean by this, and, and what's going on, and a little bit of the background, and so yeah. So last last week we talked about what it might look like in practice in your everyday life, um, and how you might you know kind of just incorporate it. And this week I'd kind of like to be a little bit more precise and um, and talk about, you know, now that we know, you know, what the painting looks like, let's talk about that kind of number system and, and drill down a little bit. Um, so I had some definitions and, and some things like that to go over. Good. So um, some people here already use that term, but they apply error for living and 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 working with children ah uh-huh how 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 is uh, how is this working like how how can people work with children is there a combination that we can do the same thing with children what you can do with dog i i would think so and i and i think the a beautiful question um i would think that the analogy with children would be so, for example, you know that your toddler is going to get tired, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon and need a nap. And so instead of waiting for him to get fractious and, you know, yell and scream and kick and bite and, you know, depending upon how bad your toddler is, what you might want to do is set up the environment for them so that that nap is a very natural uh, occurrence at that time of day. So we'd start doing things like, you know, closing the shutters, you know, making a quiet environment. And then we might say, you know, oh, hey, look, it's time for your nap. Let's go sing the nappy song. You know, so you are a reliable um, communicator of the next need that the child has. And so you are providing for those needs in a nice, safe environment. And you are the one who is making sure, not uh, not forcefully arbitrating it, not forcefully ordering it, but opening the door and saying, look, here is this next opportunity. And so there is, you know, that the animal, in this case, the child is gonna say, wow, I really am tired you know, knock on wood, and not, I'm going to be missing out, but oh, look, my mom's going to be right next to me and providing me the comfort and everything that I need in order to take a nap. So, so you're, you're, you're trying to tell me right now that if somebody pays attention to what we're talking today, it doesn't only apply to dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say it. People say it because people told me like, hey, you know what? I I I like the I, I watched the first video and I totally can see that and actually I'm doing the same thing with my children in school because this was a teacher actually, and I was like, yeah, yeah, it works and, there too. I just yeah. wanted to hear from original source. Yeah, and and I I love it that somebody said that. Um, I get in we as dog trainers get into trouble a lot with this because people want to say you know kids are not dogs we you know and i totally Who said that <laughs> i know right my little fur pup for i'm a fur mommy i <laughs> um the the that we the the thing is is that the same kind of principles apply even yes kids are not dogs um Kids have a lot more voice and we can do a lot more to explain things, but the same basic principles apply with our kids, potentially even with our spouses and stuff like that. Although I really don't recommend you get out the clicker trainer with your spouse um, without full and complete buy-in and clarity that yes, you're going to be playing with this clicker because <clears throat> people don't like to be manipulated. Right, right, right. <clears throat> By the way, speaking of clicker, small insert. <clears throat> I, I know from a friend of mine. She is a gymnast, gym gymnast, gymnast mm-hmm. trainer, um, and she does competition with right. children. She used the clicker to mark yes. the well-performed body posture. 
So yeah. she helps them remember. So the clicker doesn't work only for dogs, it works with children too. Um, but of course it has to be educated accordingly. So don't try this at home kind of sort of, yes you do, but you have to edu educate it properly to do that. You can train chickens, you can train children, you can train dogs. I usually do that with people in the house. Mm -hmm. When we do the clicker training, I help people click each other to actions they have not talked about. Yeah. which works very funny <laughs> honey i didn't tell you to clean the dishes <laughs> <laughs> um it's, it's funny so, you mention that because i just went out and bought a bunch of um little round dots to use as part of tag teach which is what the right, right. training goes back to yeah. so how how do we apply now the mythology of error free like hands-on on a house what, where do we start how how do we prime the dog do we prime the dog what's the situation like what do we need to know yeah so i would say so there's absolutely a place for clicker training and for doing you know formal training sessions oh look you know here i'm going to pull out my treat pouch and we're going to do x y and z but what i'd like to say and and everybody knows this and talks about this is the dog is learning every moment that they're awake. And in fact, they're probably learning while they're asleep too. They're taking things from short term into long term memory. But learning is ongoing. We all know this, we all work with this as trainers. And and I had a, an epiphany last night and kind of been working on it over the last couple of weeks. What I, you know, I go out and I work with my clients, we learn little, um, you know, little protocols. And I'm like, you know, train for two to five minutes at a time. But that's not, you know, there's 24 hours in a day. And so these dogs are constantly learning. So there's a huge opportunity now for us to, to use our actions in daily life in order to um, create the kind of relationship that we want with our dogs. We don't just want a relationship in that two to five minutes. We don't just want good behavior in those two to five minutes. We want good behavior, you know, that 24 seven. And what I've been struggling with in terms of training my clients is how to transfer these little training protocols that I do. And, you know, these master fabulous, you know, timing skills with a clicker and everything is to translate that into that 24 seven. And it's not, it, you know, these aren't training skills. This is lifestyle skills. And so it starts, it starts the second that you or your dog wakes up in the morning. What do you do when your dog first wakes up? What do you, you know, our dogs are all a little bit different. Some of our dogs are, you know, they're slug of beds. They don't want to crawl out of bed until 10 a.m. But for most of us, our dogs are saying, hey, look, I just woke up. I kind of got to go potty. And if instead of saying, yeah, no, I got to go get my coffee and read the news and everything. If I say the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, good dogs, come with me, open the door. They get to pee. There's this wonderful feeling of relief. It's actually rewarding, right? They are just been rewarded for listening to me say, hey, come with me, right? I don't have to break out the treats. I don't have to do potty training with, you know, 10,000 calories. I'm just doing potty training using that natural biological rhythm and being a clear communicator of, look, this is now your opportunity to do this. Wait, you're behaving like a parent. As, as somebody who doesn't have little pink primates, um, I, I can't vouch for that, <laughs> but I, I would hope that, yeah, yeah, that the, yeah. you know, good parenting would involve making sure your child's needs are met. And all I'm adding to the equation is being a good communicator of that, of those opportunities. Okay, let's say, for example, we wake up in the morning and, and we have the dog and we kind of think through the process, how do I apply my, technically speaking, physically reward-free approach? What do I need to know so I can be compliant with my dog needs? Well, I just said it. 
Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, I have an answer for that question as you phrased it, but I'd like to hear what your what your thinking process was there. So let me answer quickly and, and then I circle back. I would say that we need to know how to um, we we need to know what our dog's needs are, um, and we need to be able to predict those, um, and and that's going to be watching body language. Um, body language is really, really important and um, responding to their communication to us. Um, so, you know, if, if <laughs> one of the ones that a long time learned was one of my dogs comes and climbs in my lap and wins potty. And I'm a ghoulist dog owner, right? I'm like, oh, what you do? This. And he's like, oh, the scratches are okay, but really, I gotta go pee. So, look, I'll turn. That that was what he needed, and you know, but I did that through a process of listening and responding, and realizing that the petting wasn't getting him all that he needed, right? Because if it gets him what he needs, he's going to relax and, you know, lay down and take a nap or something like that. Um, I'm going to put a little star on that, a little caveat that we may have time to go in later. Um, where, you know, if I take him out and go and go potty with him, he's going to come in and he's going to go, ah, oh, this was wonderful and lay down and go to sleep. If his needs aren't going getting met, he's going to keep asking. He's going to keep ratcheting up that body language. Um, again, another little asterisk there, or that communication is complex, but that's the basics. So. Gotcha. So <laughs> to, 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 to circle back to me, when I was asking <clears throat> about what do we need to know, um, my dear friend Linda, um, did a very interesting project couple of years back when, when I started meeting her and I hope at some point I will be able to get her um, here to chat with us so um, the idea was to hold on I screwed up I guess here let me see if I did it right um, not really uh, let me fix that part um, yeah I can see that I'll, I'll check it in soon um share screen window i'll find it here you go that so she created this mm -hmm. um hierarchy of needs of dogs and i think it's very important for us to learn um what exactly that is because once we we understand how this works then we know exactly how to keep those schedules, right? So once we understand the biological need, as you mentioned before, you know, the dog needs to go to the bathroom, that then you become the supplier and supporter of that reinforcement to bring the dog outside for potty, which more and more you're reversing the dog that you offer those solutions, right? Yeah. And then you cover the emotional needs. The dog wants affection or the dog wants treats, something that makes him happy, right? And so all these things come into the equation and then you have social needs. The dog wants interaction. So you can use that also as a reward in the morning to start with. Yeah. And then the 24-hour the training skills, what you mentioned. However, even though dogs need, you know, need to sleep 18 hours, the rest of them are basically always aware of what you're doing. So they know when you're leaving, which is part also for your training to work on separation anxiety. And then finally, <clears throat> you have also you know, going to the, to the highest level on the cognitive needs. So from that perspective, once we recognize all those needs, we can start implementing them in error-free living, right? Yeah, 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 very much so. So tell me about this. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to, because some people are visual learners, some people, you know, are auditory learners, some people are very tactile um, and experiential. And I really encourage you guys who are experiential which is most of us, by the way, to go out there and try this, to really go out and, and say, can I live a day? Or, hi, Isabel. Um, 
to live a day or two. You might not be able to do it all the time, but but to try walking through the day and see if you can predict your dog's needs, listen to him and stuff like that. This, this graphic here is just super simple. I just wanted to make sure that that we had it out there in print for people to see. An errorless living, um, you know, it's just using the natural rhythms, the daily cycle of needs and wants to increase your bond with your dog and to increase obedience. And, you know, like I mentioned with the going out to potty, you know, rewarding the dog using functional rewards. Um, and the, so I am just, I, I want to really stress that it's, this is not coercive. I am not withholding food so that the dog will ask me for it. So then I can do training. Um, <laughs> I am predicting that the dog is going to be hungry. Uh, you know, after our walk, after he's got gone potty, I don't, most of you probably know that if your dog has to take a poop, he's not going to be very hungry. Right. So, you know, so we, we meet some needs and then the dog's like, oh my God, I'm suddenly, I'm starving. <laughs> you know, um, So I want to be a reliable communicator of the next opportunities that are available. And I might ask for, you know, for a sit or a down or a spin or something like that. And I might, and I might give some of those social and mental needs as I'm doing this, um, you know, I might ask for a wait before we go out to go potty, but I'm not waiting until the dog is dressed. I am providing. Right. But you're, you're asking reasonable questions. You're not coming out of nowhere. Oh, I'm going to starve you so you can need me more and actually create a negative experience that food is being used like <clears throat> the KGB, <laughs> MI6 <laughs> <laughs> or FB, whatever you call it. Like, um, That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we need to be aware that you can approach different ways, different things, but it always depends on how your dog feels about it. Yeah. So if you use food to get what you want, that can be very abusive. Yeah. I Coming guess. from my perspective, you know, as a child with um, um, trauma experience, um, waiting for things that are needed, needed and waiting for things that are supposed to be there without me begging for it, it's a traumatic experience. Why would the dog be hungry and only be able to get it from you? You basically disable your dog to start with. Yeah. It, and, it increases stress. And, and this is, we actually have some data on this, which was really interesting. Um, if you withhold your dog's meal and ask them to wait until you put the dish down, it is correlated with increased resource guarding <laughs> <laughs> right and that is, is that matching your experiences as a trauma survivor with oh yeah with, with limited food supplies yeah. yeah well just a question oh why are you coming to me what do you need yeah i just want to give you a hug man <laughs> right. what do i need a hug why is it such why do i have to have such an effort for something that's effortless right yeah and there's why a, do i need to work so hard for errorless right. leaving <laughs> yeah and there's a beautiful so so one of the old training styles out there was uh nilf nilif nothing in life is free and um, this was the idea that the dog anytime the dog needed something he had to ask you for something first and the dogs that i've seen that are trained this way are very shut down. They're very non-communicative. They don't come and freely ask. They would rather, you know, rather not really interact with you. And it, it depends on how strict you are and stuff like that. But what I want with my relationship with a dog is I want somebody who loves to be with me, who, you know, we're partners and we're having fun and, you know, who listens to me because he wants to, you know, because, because it's so fun to be with me. Um, good question, Bonnie. My dogs eat at four. So if my dog wants to eat at two, should I feed her then? That's a really great question. And, and there's the, the answer is not a simple yes, absolutely. Um, 
And the reason it isn't is because sometimes dogs who are chronically bored will instead use eating as a substitute for mental enrichment. And so, if you'll be a trainer and you're, you're having that issues, you have in the storage about three or four cans of Nutella. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, what I often do with my dogs is, and, and my dogs are in really pretty good condition for the most part, um, is that I start out with their dinner has a, has a yummy little appetizer and then it goes into, you know, the, the regular part of the meal, the boring old kibble with a little bit of stuff in it. And then if they tell me they're still hungry, well, now they're getting dry kibble doled out, right? Because I don't want to overfeed my dogs. I don't want to say, oh my God, you know, I, just like us and the can of Nutella, you know, I don't want to sit there and eat 12 cans of Nutella and, and become obese. And if I let my dogs know that, yes, they can have really wonderful stuff, but at a certain point in time, you know, it's, we're going to be down to, okay, you've cleaned out the fridge and now all that's left is the celery. Um, if you're still hungry, you're going to eat it, right? And I'm going to know it. So if they're still hungry, if, if they're asking for food at two o'clock, you might go ahead and feed them a handful. You might also ask if what they're really asking for is a, a sniffy walk or a bowling game where you toss kibble left and right. You might check their body condition and see if they're fat or if they're skinny. You might check health measures by talking to your vet and saying, look, do we have a thyroid issue or a diabetes issue going on? So there are, there's caveats. So first of all, rule out medical conditions, Absolutely. or then you might want to check nutritional conditions. Yeah. Uh, some people, think like a puppy should eat two times a day and the puppy is of course hungry at three o'clock some dogs have um emotional conditions and they need food to feel safe yeah. and they're coming from separation anxiety slash you know um trauma experience then sometimes there is an organ system that doesn't work well so the dog the internal clock is kind of messed up <clears throat> so we have we have solutions so if you guys have any questions and you're struggling with these kind of things of course, you can uh, reach out to um, Caitlin and um, and get the answers there. We are both available for that. Or this and <laughs> oh, oh yeah, me. <laughs> right? Yeah, you know what? I, I I like sharing your stuff because we we both come from a from a place of education and um, and and having the heart for the dogs for sure. Right. And I, the one thing that I was talking with my wife yesterday because we had the the chance to have brunch together but was it brunch or lunch dinner i don't remember i think it was lunch dinner right um and we just talk about stuff and on our way out um i my wife is usually very intuitive to stuff she's, like, she's kind of a very nice person and i was like yeah <laughs> and i was waiting for the next word i was like she's like she she knows her sh stuff so <clears throat> and i was like yeah well yeah and, and that's why i like uh, talking to her because she has this broad experience knowledge and you know some people who have pthd and you know they have these titles like a toilet paper roll they're so untouchables mm -hmm. and all beyond that and you kind of feel intimidated talking to them but i like the fact um that we both share the same idea dumping it down to a level that everybody can understand it if you if you have an idea about dog training and you cannot explain that to a five-year-old man, do, some, do a different job because you have to explain it to a dog, right? So if you cannot explain it to a dog and you cannot explain it to a, to a child, then don't do dog training because it is about bringing it down individual pieces. So the other one who needs it can actually process it. So yeah. early sleeping comes also from the same aspect. If you cannot explain your dog all these individual pieces that you are here to provide, how would the dog recognize that you are the one who's providing it? Putting the ball down and walking away is not just that thing. It is a ritual. It's a ritual that has two people, one who is receiving it and one who's offering it. And I'm not saying you have to the dog to sit down and stay for an hour for you to put the ball down, but having be part of that. Hey, you know what? 
let's respect my space. I respect your space. You respect my space. Do as I do. If I give you space and I give you, you know, your room to eat, why would you resource guard? Because you're not afraid I'm taking it away from you because I respect your space and you respect my space. It, that's why uh, giving that approach 24-7, meaning is I have to just be aware of what I'm doing 24-7. So my dog perceives that information 24-7 and he can supply it and recreate it 24-7. So error is living is not just a dog not having errors. It's about us not having errors, teaching the dog how to not having errors. Okay, now I need a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you drink the coffee, and I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in with a couple of things here because and and bless Barbara, I thank you. That's very gracious. Um, the the I want to say that um, you know I've been a geeky researcher for several decades now, um, and I want to say that I'm geeky but but dumbing down is is um is sadly a, a poor choice of words and i know that it's in the language but yeah it, sorry sorry guys it, it's okay but you i want to say it in greek i tell in greek is my first language <laughs> <laughs> um i i want to say that you know the folks that i've worked with who are who don't have phds and who are um you know farmers and ranchers working out there you know on the land and you know my folks come my dog training clients come from all different backgrounds these people aren't dumb people know a lot of, and they have good hearts and they a lot of what we what we um do with dogs is already you know it's 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 right there at the cusp you know we've got a lot of these instincts already and we just need to tap into them. We just need to realize that, you know, we don't we don't have to be the boss dog. We have to be the smart one, um, and and we have to set some rules and boundaries so that they don't get run over in the street. But these folks are plenty smart, and it's just a question of choosing. So for the trainers out there, choose a language that your clients can understand. So if you are talking to a geeky research professor. <laughs> fine talk about you know learning theory and stuff like that although my guess is is that if they're a geeky research professor they're a geeky research professor in mathematics or music or something like that and you're still going to have to make those human analogies that are understandable by everyone um but but talk to people at at the language level that they're comfortable speaking in um, it's just a very simple cultural shift number one and what was the number two thing on that um oh well i've forgotten it'll come back eventually <laughs> yeah you know for me it's also difficult um having english as a third language um, using those words um and so i have to rephrase and m my wife also says let me roman explain it <laughs> so if i make posts and i don't get them being spell checked or you know grammar checked people have no clue what i'm talking about <laughs> so I'm, I'm having a lot of effort so i understand what you're saying but at the same time <clears throat> i see also what people and dogs are struggling with because i always refer to to scientific papers to compare to to confirm the path that i walked so far sometimes we get those um informations afterwards what we have done for many years and then suddenly a research comes out and actually confirm what we have done. And I was like, and I can't even read it because you know, they're so compressed in a, in a form that you have to kind of wrap your mind around those words. <clears throat> and then you have to research the individual words. And if I think we could do the same thing with dogs, yeah, we, we throw so many emotions on the dog and, and unrelated emotions. I see people, for example, they want to help their dog go over a stress situations and they ask them to sit yeah. while they are frustrated. Put the dog in a traumatic experience, in a freeze state, right? And stagnancy while I'm feeling threatened and my dog is forced to defend me and himself. Right. I think we should be aware of that too. 
how how our emotions affect our dogs and errorless living is not just about talking about it or doing actions it's our bringing our emotions in alignment with what we're doing and what we're saying yeah and and uh, you know it's it's um <laughs> That's a kind of a graphic way of, of reminding people that our dogs are incredibly emotionally in tune with us. Um, they are, they can smell, at, like I've had my dogs walk in and smell the fact that my knee is sore. I'm like, you know, it's not a gaping wound or anything. It's just a sore knee. Like what chemicals are coming through there that the dogs are up there and sniffing it. If you're stressed, if you're angry, if you're upset, the dogs can smell that. They can see it. They, you know, they are such good readers of body language. So I do, I have, uh, he's asleep at my feet right now. Ajax up for adoption, guys. You guys want the best dog in the world. Yep. <laughs> he's, um, you know, one of the, the neat things about um, him is that, is that any time I have any emotions, like he instantly responds. And one of the things that I did early on when, when training with him is just by accident, I measured my blood pressure before working with him. And this was back when he was really scary. And then I measured my blood pressure after working with him. And I had the lowest blood pressure I've ever had in my life. And that's because I think um, is, you know, when I work with these guys, I'm constantly modeling the emotions that I want them to have. Um, you know, so, so I will go through my day and, you know, I look my dogs in the eyes and smile at them. You know, they can read our facial expressions and I'm happy to see them. I'm genuinely happy to see them. And, you know, and if there's something scary off in the distance, you know, I stop and I breathe and I wait for a couple of seconds and then I say, let's go and we move away, right? So I'm calm and I'm centered and I'm present during all of these interactions. And I'm aware of my dog's body language and I'm supportive of my dog going through these emotions. My dog looks at the scary thing. I'm not going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you have to pay attention to me. I'm saying, it's okay, look at this thing from a safe distance. If, if we're too close, I am gonna say, let's get back. I'm going to do what needs to be done to make sure that we're safe, but I'm going to let him look and then I'm going to be there to be the support system. And when he turns back to me, or if he needs prompting to turn back to me, I will provide that prompt. But what, when he turns back to me, I'm like, yay, right on. We survived. We did. <laughs> we're rocking this. I, I want to share a picture uh, because we talked about, you know, how, how we feel to our dogs. Um, <clears throat> This is from Barbara Brennan. She is a, actually a scientist who works, um, I think she worked for NASA, if I remember right, or, or, or a very or, a, an organization, a, 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 let's call it um, a government organization. And right. so she, she intuited or she educated people how things look like. So let me make it a bigger picture. Thank you. Um, <laughs> As I this, this this is for example how energy look like when people interact mm -hmm. so the the first picture is um por the porcupine picture okay the next one is how withdrawal looks like um that's some um, somebody he looks like beyond himself okay this is how the verbal denial looks like uh -huh. This is how the energy looks like if we are oral sucking. And this is how it looks like when we are, um, let me see if I can make it bigger. Can you see it bigger now? Uh, yeah, mental grasp and hook. Yeah. Right. Interesting. And so if, if we, for example, approach a person and we're working with a guardian breed and then we approach a person for a gap, I think the dogs will see that picture and see basically a predatory intention towards yeah. the person, the other one person will be a victim. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, not all the dogs can see that. M many dogs can do though, who are energetically higher vibrating. And, and these are just how the interactions between people and, and other people look like. And so we are angry and we are having um, a boundary of containment over the dog, like coming in and shield ourselves up or 
we are kind of coming in and despotic put our position we have a power and will display these are things that can trigger a dog mm -hmm. and this is not only what a dog can see here but also sometimes um it's the intentions that we put out there yeah our energetic intention and i think if we do errors errors free living we should also pay attention to how our emotions are expressed and our intentions are projected onto the dog so if i have being a victim state of mind and my dog expresses himself as being my protector then why i'm complaining about him being reactive hmm. i'm setting my dog up for failure right there if i'm not stamping in my parenting power and i was like oh my dog is barking what should i do no bad dog um okay so who's gonna fix the problem if you don't yeah and fixing the problem doesn't mean the dog is being punished is helping the dog understand why this situation that picture that he sees is not the real reality and so we have to go, go ahead oh i was just gonna say i know a lot of people who fix barking problems by going opening the door looking out and going okay i see it i got it it's cool and the dog's like yay okay <laughs> it's cool yeah <laughs> we we actually reward we, we reward a, a false image I wouldn't have phrased it that way. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. Because if a dog has an idea of a reality that's not the reality because your dog has a trauma brain, mm -hmm. then you reinforce that trauma brain telling, oh, you're right, there was somebody out there. I have no clue what you're talking about. But yeah, thank you for telling me that I have to go up and open the door and check out on you. But well, instead, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, a lot of times the dogs are barking at something now their hearing is much better than ours and stuff like that so a lot of times the dogs are barking at something that is real that's out there but you probably don't care about it. it's like oh god it's the mailman again you know we really don't need to bark at the mailman and telling him that telling him yes i see it thank you for telling me and i'm not worried about it giving off right. that body language of i'm not worried about it they pick up on it and they're like okay we're cool i i totally agree with that so you're not reinforcing that you're explaining your dog that you are there and i'm here and i'm telling you here is safe and you feel up there unsafe and mm -hmm. you create that platform for the dog to come down to that level where he feels safe with you yeah. which comes in from a perspective hey what's what the why, why are you struggling in other words your child is driving with a bicycle and falls down you can do two things making your child a drama queen Oh my God, did you hurt yourself? Oh my, oh my God, you're bleeding. Quick to the kitchen. Or right. you says, oh, yeah. you fell down? Okay, now what do we do to get up? <laughs> right. Okay, good. Now let's go in the kitchen and fix it up so we don't have any other problems with that. And let's go back to the bicycle. Yeah, I love that that kind of approach. I think that's very important. And because at some point, we don't, we don't make that situation becoming a trauma drama. Mm -hmm. we want that to become an experience mm -hmm. okay a mailman comes in she doesn't give a bark he doesn't give a bark i guess i don't give a bark either so if i barked sorry it just came out of me you know oh that's fine totally okay no big deal but i would prefer if you don't so next time you see these things happening why don't you go first place to your place and let me know that somebody's out there without the barking part yeah yeah well, so nice clear communications are important yeah, a, a nice little woof, you know, a lot of dogs will just gradually drop to where they've got just a very limited woof. Bark. I mean, for yeah. four million generations, we trained them to do that. Or, you know, we didn't train them, but we were enforced it to do that. And all of a sudden, now we don't want it. I know. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say, so um, I, I want to say about error-free living, it, it's not this idea that we make no mistakes. Um, don't set yourself up that way because that's a you're going to punish yourself a lot if you say oh error-free living means that i can't make mistakes error-free living means um you, we're going to try to set up the cycle of our day so we're moving from one reward process to another so you know i may miss the signals that my dogs need to go potty that's it's that's okay it's not the end of the world they will eventually inform me um i want to make it as easy as possible for them and what i don't want to do is i don't want to put them in a position 
where they're desperately stressed out and and I'm having to tell them, no, stop bugging me. Don't do that because I haven't met their needs. So the error-free part of it is me responding to their needs in such a way that I am, again, that reliable predictor and communication of normal bodily functions and living processes, which we all find rewarding. Oh, Shamara, interesting. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the group. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I appreciate your feedback. And um, <clears throat> I, I'm coming from an angle that I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I'm a crossover trainer. I used to do things that I basically, I'm upset now, other people do. Um, but I learned. So I think errorless living doesn't mean you're coming in from a God perspective. No. <laughs> I'm not making mistakes. Um, if, if we look, mistakes. Right? <laughs> if we look into nature, um, we, we see nature doesn't care about the mistakes, but it learns from it. And improves it so we, we call it evolution and i think you you, you did actually study right <laughs> and, <laughs> I and got I, the gold star in the forehead right, right, right. And, and i think one, once we come for an aspect and I said you know what you cannot be perfect because if you would be perfect you would already be ascended master right and watching our show definitely you're not <laughs> you will kind of laugh about it but anyway um even even ascended masters, if we go a little bit in the spiritual sidekick here, even ascended masters come down here to learn how emotions are being played out in a three D dimension, yeah. and and dogs come down here as I would say masters in in their spiritual level to come and learn how to apply emotions and how to experience emotions. Because in that level, we and they come from emotions is something that's happened consistently all the time, but we cannot express them. It's just an experience and a, like, let's say a feeling, but how do you technically speaking, have an emotion interaction with that cup? How can you have an emotional interactions with nature? And we, we try to communicate because I don't, I don't think or I don't feel we have ever come so far to feel how an animal feel like and have this empathy. Because love alone, if we, call it, if we look into unconditional love, unconditional love means I love you as I love myself. So therefore, we are one because I love you as I love myself. So you, that's why there's something in common. If we look into that aspect, living with a dog is sharing emotions, interacting emotionally, express the dog how you feel about a behavior. And so your dog can give you a feedback how he feels about the behavior, what makes you adjust your behavior because you recognize how your dog feels about your behavior and becomes a behavior synchronization, mm. an emotional synchronization, which means just with your husband um, or your partner or you have you live with, how would it feel like if the person says, hmm, how about a cup of coffee? And you're like, oh my God, you can read my mind. <laughs> how, how does it feel to you? And then if we go to the dog level and you say, hey, how about breakfast? And your dog is like, holy bark, how did you know? Right. <laughs> say, oh, how do I know? Favorite, yeah. Right? Like, hey, now, how, how about we go to the bathroom? I said, man, your wish is my command, man. <laughs> <laughs> so once we learn to, to tap into that ritual that we created for the dog to be educated how to live effortlessly, errorlessly, er, yeah, you know what I mean, right? <laughs> um, in, in our human environment that is so animal unfriendly, mm -hmm. okay? Right. And, and we teach them how to navigate that experience alone is already rewarding in itself. Very much. Very and, and I see many people who says, hey, I want to be the pack leader. Good, nice try. And I says, I want to be um, the, the alpha. And I was like, ew. How, <laughs> like, 
if we come from that aspect and understand the concepts behind that and, and what we are fooled into believe, we're setting a doghouse for failure. Yeah. It so there are a lot of concepts out there that are misleading us to be full of errors. And we need to kind of step back from that a little bit and kind of see that, is that in alignment with what I need to do as a person? Is it in alignment with what I have to offer to my dog to learn from? Is this a fight about leadership here or is the fight about any fight? We shouldn't fight at all in our relationship. It's It should be effortlessly. Yeah, we, we should be, in my beliefs, we should be partners and it shouldn't be a competition to see who is going to win the argument. Like, I, I, my dogs aren't my lovers, you know. I, I have a human partner and he's a wonderful independent man and I absolutely adore him. Um, and the neat thing about our relationship is that he is himself and I am our, myself and, and we work together. We don't always agree on everything, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is okay. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes we eat a little earlier than I want to eat, for example, you know, but it's, it's no big deal that most of our disagreements aren't any big deal. The disagreements are noticeable because we feel disagreements so much more strong. Like if somebody says, I like coffee and I go, yeah, I like coffee too. It doesn't have the same emotional response as somebody who says, you know, you shouldn't like coffee. Coffee is bad for you. You know, that sets up a defensive response and your emotions get all out of whack. So confrontation and conflict really resonates. Like if the dog needs are not getting met, he's going to sit there and poke at you in confrontation, in conflict until his needs get met. That doesn't feel good because you're getting told, look, I, you have to meet their needs. And if instead you can go, hey, we're partners. I know you need to eat. Let me feed you before you're starving, before you feel the need to really ask. You know, let me invite you over for dinner. Um, I have a, a very hilarious thing on my telephone because my partner needs to eat earlier in the day than I do. So I have a little alarm that says 5.30 Kelly food, right? <laughs> not, not, you know, he's capable of fixing his own food, but it's just really helpful if I can say, oh, not a problem. You know, it's time for me to start wrapping up what I need to do and make sure that he gets to eat. My stuff, it doesn't matter whether it gets done at 5.30 or 7.30, but if I do it for him at 5.30, and then I come back and I do the rest of my stuff at 7.30. He's happier. We're a better partnership. Then he can wash the dishes for me. Right. So it's, it's, I mean, synch synchronicity? Uh, what's the word that I want? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I agree with you. Actually, um, I have a workshop today, 3 o'clock Pacific time, um, about, yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, it's, you know, adopting a dog and, and the key to successful adoption. We, we talk about that. We, we, we break it down how a dog comes into our family and, and how we start using those applications that we talked about today. And the, the good thing is you, you, you mentioned it already and you, and you create basically a modality around that. Um, I'm coming from the same angle. Um, I just don't have a modality around it <laughs> and, and I really appreciate you. And I know you guys having a, a workshop coming up soon. So we need to understand that too. So we're going to share it to people um, for you guys who are quick clickers. Um, check it out. It's today, three o'clock Pacific time. You can join. Um, it's a, it's a one and a half hour, um, very intensive workshop about what things need to be to, to addressed in order to have an adoption successful. We know right now 13% of dogs being returned to shelters. Okay, 10% for you guys who are very picky about it. However, um, those numbers of returns are only related to shelters and rescues and only capture 20% of all dogs who are being changed homes the last couple of years, the last year. 
So we're not capturing the 80% of dogs who have been changed home and come into a home. We only capture the 20%. And those 10% of dogs who are being returned are only capture those 20% and not the 80% that are left out of that study. Mm. And I want just to stop that from happening. Right. Um, we are in a critical period of time where people still going back to work and things going back to normal-ish. And the first one who have to pay the bill are the dogs who are not being supported being errorless, um, and we want to make sure that this is the last call, um, not only for the workshop, but not having the dogs being returned. Um, there is a, a massive amount of dogs being trapped in the shelters right now. The shelters are overwhelmed. Non-kill shelters suddenly become kill for behavior and kill for medical, and, and many rescues are being turned into kill um, because the foster homes are overwhelmed. And their, their behavior dogs who are really, really long-term behavior dogs and they will not be able to address it, um, they have to go to extreme solutions sometimes because people in these stressful homes, you know, having overwhelmed with dogs, uh, behaviors being out of control at some point, and um, we, we need to support that. And we had actually um, last Saturday, I will put the link also in the comments about that chapter and we talked about that so you guys want to go and refer to that um, if you're interested but um, it's still time um, to join my class it's really low cost ridiculous low cost it's $37 to join the class and it may save your dog for being returned and if you share that class it may actually help other people not to return their dogs because they're simple very simple instructions that will make their staying at your home safe and secure and successful in the future um okay i have Done a that. question yes about that as as one of those incredibly busy people is this are you going to record any of this or? yes it will be recorded and will be available um after to purchase into a discounted um, price um, the reason why i have a different price range is because people can ask live questions by the end of the workshop so we have a live q a and um, in this half an hour plus, we're going to go through all the questions, answer them. And um, for those who don't have time but want still to get the information and don't really have a lot of questions after the workshop, um, they will have access to it and, re and record it. It's also supported with diagrams and information. Awesome. Um, and then based on that, we have more deeper. I have a foster education class that comes up, and also I have... Um, approach for professionals who want to go into holistic route to um, learn the skills that I have so far. And it's not something that I say people um, don't know as much as I do. But you know, I have five tools in my toolbox you don't have. Why not grabbing those five tools and be better than I am? No right. big deal. Um, and so that's why you come from and also you, you share your toolboxes. You have big toolbox and people can benefit from it. So. Yeah, we're sharing our toolbox and see what kind of tools we have. Maybe you can use one of those and do be more successful in, in what you're doing because we need more people like you to be more successful than we are so we, we can step back and say, you know what, we actually made a difference. <laughs> if we die tomorrow, I says, you know what, we made a difference. We saved, we saved ideas, we saved um, dogs, we saved people. And, um, and I'm, I'm so grateful. Amazing. Too. I know that a lot of the ideas that I have come from uh, studying multiple different um, philosophies or reading different books. And it's like all of a sudden, you know, this piece of information and this piece of information, you know, they combine. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> light bulb. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, what a perfect prop. Yeah. No, that's that's really lovely. I, I may um, I may grab that link from you to share for our folks. I, I so appreciate. <clears throat> and um, yeah, we have two minutes left. Does anybody have any questions? Very quick. Um, and is there anything you want to share? Closing about era free living with dogs. Um, I want to. Uh, so it, unless we have. Um, let me offer a couple of resources for people thinking about these kinds of ideas and seeing if you want to jump off with them. 
as far as I know, there's really nobody talking about using these biological rhythms. The, the, uh, it comes from a whole bunch of different places. Um, I want to say functional rewards. So words that you can look up on the internet and kind of start to think about. Premac, um, using a dog's desires to, you know, and checking in with you is a great tool. There is um, a slow dog movement, which I really highly recommend people look into. Um, you know, and this is this is enjoying your dog. This is spending time with your dog, and it's just beautiful. It's really awesome. Um, Error-free training. A bunch of people are doing this, and it's really amazing. So fantastic, folks. Pathways to Friendship is a book that is not popular in the U.S. yet and should be. And she's an amazing German trainer who works with the dog's natural drives to do things like build a recall and um, prevent critter chasing. And uh, Uli, and I can't pronounce her last name, but Pathways to Friendship, great book. Um, Plenty in Life is Free is a little bit older, but it's a really, it's a classic book. You know what? I like that better than Nothing for Life is Free because it yeah. just comes in so wrong and so controlling. Well, that was, right. Yeah, she has this amazing analogy in there, not analogy, a story in there about a trainer who literally withheld oxygen from his, um, from his dolphins in order to get compliance. And if you don't think that's coercive, you know. Well, you know, it, we choke dogs to compliance. Yeah. That's right? Nasty. Not we. Uh, yeah, no. Many <laughs> trainers, we, which I kind of like. And they see totally normal. Yeah. To, they see totally okay. Yeah. You wouldn't choke your child or your lover or your, you know, or your coworker. You know, <laughs> that's not an appropriate way of communicating. <laughs> there are different ways of choking. Okay, no joke. <laughs> um, you can choke emotionally your partner. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, shouldn't do that either. Right, we don't. Right. But you can choke also emotionally your dog. Yeah. Asking weird questions. Why did he do it? What do you expect him to get? The answer to a puzzle? <laughs> <laughs> Put, putting the dog in that question is already a trigger. Um, and instead of blaming yourself, why would you leave the garbage bin open? Right. <laughs> Why would you leave without explaining your dog? Um, yeah, uh, Brenda. Brenda is actually um, kind of our in-house uh, nutritionist and um, homeopath. Um, highly recommend uh, if you have nutritional or homeopath issues or you know approach that you need for your dogs. Um, she's very good in approaching things, and we had actually a, a, a session, a call, a couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, very interesting. You should watch it. I, I need to friend you, Brenda. <laughs> I need a whole hey, <laughs> hey, I'm resource guarding here. No, you don't. <laughs> um, yeah, totally, totally have it on a speed dial. Um, and you know, having having a, a nutritionist and and a homeopath on your back, um, being able to handle situations like over vaccinations, um, um, vac vac vaccinosis, and um, leaky guts and other emotions, uh, our other behaviors that are internal organ related, but we don't see it until somebody is pointing out to us. And it was like, oh yeah, right. It's like, you know, we have an organ issue here that causes that behavior. I'm not, I'm not taking over your job, Brenda, sorry for that. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> it helped me a lot kind of understanding. It was like, oh man, that makes totally sense. Liver, she has, the dog has a liver issue and it expresses itself in certain behaviors. Um, expression like a hot dog or a cool dog makes also totally sense if you work with a dog who barks a lot or is a spontaneous aggressive to that. Um, yeah, sure, make out, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you had a question. I, I There were two books that I recommended. One was Pathways to Friendship um, by Uli, and I, can't, and I can't pronounce her last name. The other one is Plenty in Life is Free by Kathy Sedeo. Hope I pronounced that right. S D A O. Good. Um, We're gonna. I'm gonna post the links on our comments um, below, above, below, whatever. Good. Okay. So I see you guys have no questions. There are two things. Either you didn't listen what we what the question was, 
or you really got what we're talking about, which I super appreciate. Um, yeah, funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sarcastic. I'm so German sometimes. And I'm making so weird jokes that nobody really gets. And I was like, okay, maybe the translation was wrong. Oh, um, the translations are funny. <laughs> um, now, are we seeing you next time, anytime soon, for any reason? Uh, we don't have anything on the schedule. Um, we might put something out of a month or two, I'm kind of insanely busy for talking about, uh, I don't know, maybe holistic training ideas. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, I weirdo don't talk about it a lot, and I should talk about it. Um, I, I come from an angle, I, I was very intimidated in the beginning of going that approach. Uh -huh. And there you go. Supporting my dog before he barks. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Error, errorless. Done. That's Check. right. Next. <laughs> and then he and just then, went and picked up his his pizzle stick. So. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was feel very intimidated in the beginning when I was start from being more an averse trainer into going the holistic approach, and people was um, telling me like I'm an I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, the reason why I, I do holistic because I cannot deal with aggressive dogs. And so I'm playing around with words. But I had actually a lot of success um, doing that right. because... Oh, I just want to point out that you can... He's do so cute. Hold on, hold on. Let me make it the screen bigger. Much bigger. Hold on, here we go. Good boy. Good boy. He's such a sweet guy. <laughs> he wasn't always... But I, I big, big shout out to, um, yeah, to, to making friends and, and having, um, having a fun relationship and dealing with the whole dog, for sure, for sure. Right. So holistic approach really comes in from um, incorporating all the aspects of environmental factors that affect the dog's behavior and taking in consideration that we can affect genetics to a certain amount. And so if, if we have a dog who has a genetic predisposition to certain things, we can a little bit fine tune those genetic factors by helping them in those sliding scale between intense or not intense to kind of modify them yeah. um, because dogs can adjust himself and how his breed traits are coming out. Well, working and, on stress, um, stress and anxiety, um, not only does it, does it affect the dog now? But if we're talking about, you know, genetics and heritable traits, we know that um, epigenetics can affect uh, puppies for seven generations. If mom is stressed, then we have, you know, those effects carry right. on for multiple generations. And so, we can adjust it. So especially yeah. for breeders, thank you for mentioning it, especially for breeders who want to train their puppies to evolve and those who, who are breeding. And I'm not against, you know, the breeders who breed to prever preserve the breed and preserve the breed traits. Right. I'm, I'm not for the breeders. I'm not saying against. I'm not for the breeders who bred for looks. But I'm totally anti-breeder who bred for um, profit. Uh, not profit, how you call it? Um, assets. Or there's a term for that. Where people just breed dogs to sell them and make money out of it. Um the puppy mills kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so we, we need dogs. We have always had dogs. But we need to come back to the original dog that we benefit from, the real dog, not the dog that we want is called as pets. And having a pet in your house doesn't mean your dog has to be a pet. Your dog is still a breed that has a specific breed traits that even if you call it pet, he's still a dog with specific breed traits, specific needs that we have to help the dog be balanced around that. I So my dogs of choice at the moment, now this guy is, is a foster, but my dogs are pointers. They are hardcore hunting dogs. These are dogs whose whole sole purpose in life is to look at, smell, and find birds. And I, like, I don't really like to shoot things. 
Um, I used to do falconry, but I have a I have a pigeon coop because that's what my dogs love to do because I am fulfilling their needs. Yeah. Um, if I had a terrier, we'd be out chasing mice or something. You know? Well, many people don't actually know the breed traits. I know people who have um, the Foolanders, they actually didn't know the new Foolanders are fish and net fetching dogs. Oh, wow. Totally cool. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, people who have um, terriers or they didn't know that actually terriers back in time were bred to be kitchen machinery. Oh, oh, yeah. Right? Spitz dog. Well, right? And yeah, some r running and, and random machinery equipment. Right. And I'm not saying you should put your dog in an, in, a, in an oven or something, right? But we need to understand we, we bred dogs with specific breed traits. And so if a dog gets anxious because he needs to get his energy out and run and run and run, I'm not telling you to get on a treadmill and let him run crazy and not even having a fan running, but consider that sometimes you have to accommodate around their, their needs for performance and having the, the fulfillment of accomplishment. And if you cannot have him in New York accomplishes to chasing birds because you live in the city, accomplishment is an aspect you have to look for. Just feeling your dog accomplished to fetch a toy out of a box or do kind of a dog kind of slash fly fishing and have your dog, you know, chase what you just threw out with a flirt pole. That will be an action too. So there's so many things that we can play with. There's so many awesome trainers out there who actually did great videos. Good. Okay. I will share them. Let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, yeah, hold on a second. Uh, I'll pull it up right now. Do, do, do. I'm so good at what I do. No, I don't. I have no clue. I'm trying desperately to to find to share the screen with something. Um, oh, You're so here we go. Better at this than I am. Um, there you go. Who wrote it? Kathy Zdow. Huh? You know what? Maybe we can get her on the show. Do you know her in person? uh she's um i've i've seen a couple of her her i i i've yes but I, it would be interesting um she's a wonderful person she's an amazing um so if anybody in the group watching that video right now and has kind of like a friend request from her yeah let's okay. let's talk let's have her on board and, and you know share stuff this is good the other one um and and you'll probably be able to pronounce her name um and i can you're so quick on typing word. i'm kind of like an eagle typer <laughs> one click at a time um there you go hold on let me show this quick hold on how do i do that i got lost myself Okay, I think I think I got this. Stop here, start there. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Pathways to friendship. Yeah. And I know, guys, you know what? I know sometimes buying a book is expensive. There are so many stores out there you can use. Uli Eichmann. Jawohl. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah Uli Eichmann I maybe maybe I can I can find it if you can get her on one of these that would be awesome um I don't know how well she speaks English um but but she is just she's amazing I really like her I actually would do it right away when we do that good I think we 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 did a lot today and I so appreciate you for taking your time we went over in time again <laughs> so what um and of course if you guys want me to convince Caitlin to hop on the next you know um video show um right how do we convince her <laughs> ask a couple of questions he's like you know what maybe i should talk about it maybe i should like help i tell you what you know buying me a cup of coffee is a really a really easy way to convince me yeah. okay here's what we're gonna do i'm gonna go beyond you are vaccinated already so nothing can happen to you anyway what we can do is we can actually do 
a live show sitting in a real coffee shop oh, that and would talk be about fun. stuff I, that like would be real fun. thing okay maybe why not and and maybe have um one of our uh, people who we're working with like our, our, our trainers in training and and be on the other side and we're gonna squeeze them <laughs> <laughs> asking questions like hey well what, what should we do there no i'm just kidding that's yeah okay are i going to run here um me too i'm totally out of coffee <laughs> So it was nice talking to you guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sharing the video. Thank you for not resource guarding our show. And um, yeah, you can still comment below. We will likely respond to that. Um, and yeah, looking forward to see you next time. Um, especially if your class is up and ready to go. We're going to definitely... I <laughs> got you right there. I got us. Yep. And we're going to talk about that, about your class, and how do we get more people to sign up? Because I do have um, a puppy class for people who have puppies right now, which I really highly recommend. And it's, it is very much based in this kind of philosophy of, you know, how do we help our dog to live in a, in a normal world? Awesome. Yeah. So check in with the website. Let me click that so you guys can see that. Here we go. Voila. And um, thanks for being here today. And um, thanks for chatting. I love your comments. And see you soon next Saturday. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. All right. Okay. Good. It was good. Did you like it? I did. Um, I I did. It was. Uh, uh, you have some good questions for sure. It's a fun <laughs> chat. So it's, and it's interesting. We're getting a little bit more um, relaxed, I think. So that's right. cool.